the afternoon session of the first rings. And uh, it's a great pleasure to have today Terry Cordova, who will tell us about recent progress in symmetries and anomalies. So without further ado, please play. Recording in progress. Great. OK, thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, I'm sorry I can't be there with everyone in person, but hopefully again soon. So uh, in these three lectures, I'll tell you a little bit about some modern developments, uh, some recent developments in the theory of symmetries and anomalies. Um, and before getting into some of the, the details, I'd like to situate the problem that we'll be talking about. So what we're going to be talking about and the motivation is this big problem in QF, the problem of RG flow. So everyone is familiar with it at a cartoon level. So we have some UV quantum field theory. And we take this as given. It comes in, uh, it comes in various varieties. For instance, it could be lattice, um, some, you know, some free fields with some interactions, maybe a strongly coupled CFD. And we'd like to ask what happens at long distances. So we'd like to run the renormalization group, ask what's going on in the infrared. Now, of course, uh, this is a hard problem because sometimes when you do this, you encounter uncoupling. And so in a sense, uh, as I'll try to motivate for you in the beginning uh, and develop over the course of the, the lectures, um, these new developments in symmetries and anomalies are exciting because they really give us new tools for thinking about and uh, tracking this basic problem in quantum field theory. So to be a little more uh, precise, ask what, what actually does one want to know about the IR? What kind of information um, might you hope to obtain? Well, if you're super ambitious, you might say, well, I want to solve the infrared. I want to know all the vacuum, all the particle excitations, um, you know, all their interactions, et cetera, the full effective field theory. That's very ambitious. Um, let me first uh, discuss the organization of the, of the properties of the vacuum. So let's organize IRs um, by properties of the vacuum. And there are, broadly speaking, two types of things, two types of behavior. So the first is the infrared, uh, it could be gapless. By that they mean, uh, by that I mean it is described by some CFT. Could be free. So there's uh, some some massless uh, some excitations that come all the way down and kiss the the vacuum at zero energy. That's why we say it's gapless. There's no gap, and no energy gap above the vacuum. And the second broad type of behavior is gapped. So here we would say that uh, all particle masses. m are strictly greater than zero. And the gap here, again, refers to the fact that there is space between the energy of the vacuum, which we said to be zero, and the energy of the first uh, particle mass. Now, uh, one can zoom in here uh, in this gap case and distinguish uh, yet two further uh, subcases, which, uh, which are commonly talked about. So the first is so-called trivially gap. So what does trivially gapped mean? This is a term of art. 
So if all particle masses m are greater than zero, then if you run the RG all the way down to the lowest possible energy, you would say, well, there's nothing there. There's certainly no particles, because you can go to a scale far below the scale of every particle mass. Um, and trivially gapped is the theory where that's really true. So this is uh, a kind of, uh, the IR, you could say, is empty. There's only the one vacuum, and there's no interesting correlators. The fact that there's no interesting correlators is not that surprising. Um, for instance, if all particle masses are uh, are greater than zero, you would think that um, that various correlation functions as a function of scale would decay exponentially. And so by the time I get to the infrared, there's nothing uh, more interesting to talk about. So that's the trivially gap theory, the simplest QFT. And then there is another, uh, a, another possibility here, a more rich possibility, which is a topological quantum field theory. So this T here means topological. And here, uh, this is also a gapped, uh, a, a gapped phase. Um, but now, instead of the IR being empty, there are, uh, there are topological correlation functions. Typically of extended operators. Extended operators mean line operators, surface operators, things beyond the usual uh, local point operators that one typically talks about in a first course in quantum field theory. And so, of course, there, there are lots of topological quantum field theories. Um, some of the most famous, uh, for instance, could be, you could talk about turns or the uh, discrete gauge theory, like ZN gauge theory. Etc. Many more. So, so from my point of view, uh, when we're studying uh, a particular given ultraviolet quantum field theory, maybe some gauge theory, S, you know, QCD or something QCD-like, uh, the first kind of question that we want to uh, ask is: Can we figure out what the infrared is as an item on this list? Can we say whether it is gapped or gapless? And if it's gapped, can we say uh, whether it's trivially gapped, really the, the boring theory, or whether there are some topological correlation function? So this is kind of the most primitive information that you could hope to find uh, about RG flows. And uh, Sorry, there's a question from... Yes, please, go ahead. So suppose we have a Maxwell theory in four dimensions, so that would fall under the category of gapless, right? Yes. Because it will be a CFT. Now, if we have Maxwell's theory in five dimensions, so we have particle masses which are n equal to zero, but it, that's not a CFT, right? So, which which category will we categorize that in? Okay. Yes, I'm. I'm. Uh, I'm. Uh, I, uh, the question is about a certain subtlety, which I was hoping to avoid, which is the subtlety of scale, but not conformally invariant theories. So, typically, the um, so, in fact, I should have really said here when I said that the gapless theory is described by some CFT, I should have said by some scale invariant theory. And then often that scale invariant theory is also a conformal field theory. But um, there are certain, um, there are certain counterexamples to that, namely free Maxwell in various dimensions other than four. Okay. Any okay. other questions? And, sorry, one more question. So, in the trivially gap theory, when you say IR is empty with no interesting correlators, does that mean that, let's say, we'll only have the identity operator and there will be no other operators itself, so there are no other interesting correlators? Or That's correct. That's correct. Yes. Okay. So, so the, the unique state, no matter what, what you choose for space in the trivially gap theory, there's the unique state, which is, you know, the vacuum, one vacuum. 
And there's only the identity operator because there aren't any any other states to transition between. Okay, thanks. Any other questions about this uh, this stuff right here? Okay, so um, so this is the kind of information we want to obtain. And what I'll tell you about over the course of uh, the next few lectures is that uh, these ideas of symmetries and anomalies are particularly potent in helping us with this uh, level of, of question. So it's a, crude, it's a crude question, but nevertheless, we'll see that symmetry can help us with this. So why? Why study symmetry? Well, you typically think that uh, renormalization is coarse graining. Um, that is, provably, information is lost. This is the content of so-called A theorems, C theorems, F theorems, and uh, letters with theorem afterwards usually are about this. So RG is a coarse graining uh, process. This is clear intuitively when one thinks about block normalization group as well. Uh, but there, we could ask ourselves, okay, a lot is lost. Um, degrees of freedom are integrated out. But is there anything that is invariant? So what is, what is invariant under RG? And one answer to this is symmetry. So symmetry, in sort of all of its different manifestations, including anomalies, higher form symmetries, fancier notions of symmetry, um, one of their big claims to fame is that they are the, they are the thing that is preserved under the renormalization group flow. So just to give you a taste of what I mean by that, Suppose we have some UV with symmetry G. What does it mean? So uh, I will uh, I will unpack what it means to, for a system to have various different kinds of symmetries momentarily. But for now, you can think of your favorite system, which has you know SU2 symmetry or U1 symmetry. G can be something very simple. So so one one consequence of this very important basic consequence is that local operators are in representations of G. Now, this basic principle that I was talking about, that symmetry is preserved under RG flow, means that you will also find that whatever the infrared is, whatever its properties on this big menu that I made for you here, the infrared will also have symmetry G. And so if we think about an effective field theory in the infrared where we have some new local operators, et cetera, one thing that we know for sure is that the local operators in the infrared must also be representations of G. So this is one elementary consequence to the statement that symmetry is preserved along an RG flow. And I should make a note here, because I have discovered that people are very confused about this. So the note is that in infinite space volume, G can be spontaneously broken. But the above is still true. So local operators still in reps. 
So here, uh, this statement in particular, that the infrared local operators are in representations of G, is true whether or not uh, G is spontaneously broken. Okay. Um, so th this this uh, is is uh, the motivation that I wanted to present to you. So so we will we will develop kind of more and more powerful iterations of this idea here as we go on, more and more powerful uh, notions of what it means that symmetry and its friends are invariant under a normalization group. And to broadly speaking, uh, give you an outline of where I'm going. So, so we'll do some general theory of symmetry. In lecture one, we'll do some anomaly. In lecture two, and then we'll do some dynamical applications. In lecture three, and uh, dynamical applications means we'll try to try to look at some particular uh, QFTs. We'll try and we'll try to say. Uh, where does their infrared fall on this possible menu using some of the tricks that we've developed? Okay, so um, if there are uh, questions about this uh, big setup, now would be a good time for them. Otherwise, we'll launch. Hey, there's a question from Antonio. So, yeah. hi. Hi, Clay. I was wondering, so when we say uh, that symmetries are preserved under IG flow, we always mean global symmetries, right? Is we are always, always, always talking about global symmetry. Gauge symmetry is a fiction. It is not a symmetry of any... Sorry, I meant... St my, I was uh, opposing it to space-time symmetries, not to, like, say, conformal symmetry or higher spin symmetry, something like this. I was worried about that. Oh, um... No, that usually fits in the similar paradigm. You just have to be careful. I mean, you know, when you say that... When I say... Um, preserved along RG flow, I should be careful, and we will indeed be careful here, that um, when we are, uh, whatever triggers the flow, say a relevant operator or, or uh, some kind of interaction, um, that, that that preserves the symmetry that we're talking about. Of course, if you just put some interaction that explicitly violates the symmetry of the G, of the ultraviolet, then the infrared won't have it. So what I'm imagining here is, you know, you have some UV QFT with, say, some U1 symmetry, and you add a U1 neutral relevant operator to the Lagrangian. Now, if you if you think about it in that point of view, then conformal symmetry is quite similar in that, um, uh, well, there won't be RG flow under conformal symmetry, but you can do you can do perturbations by exactly marginal operators, and those will preserve the conformalness of the theory. And the exactly marginal operators are precisely the ones that preserve the, the conformalness of the symmetry. The, the conformal group, rather. Uh, just, thank you. Just another quick thing. So when we say that, okay, even if the symmetry is spontaneously broken, the local operators are still in reps, I mean, is this always a non-trivial statement? It could be that they all go to the trivial representation. Exactly. So that's, that's, a, great, that's a great point. So, so, um, uh, so th this uh, this statement, um, as it stands, is a bit wimpy because uh, maybe the infrared has symmetry G, but it has it by saying that every local operator is in the trivial representation of G. So one of the things that we're going to look out for, so first of all, you're absolutely right that that's, that's a possibility in the what I've said here and often happens. Um, but one of the things we're going to look out for are tools that um, enable us to rule out that possibility, to, to show that the symmetry has to be there in a non-trivial way at long distances. Fantastic. Thank you. If there's one more question from Lucas. Lucas, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, my, my question is really supersymmetry. Are you neglecting or are you also considering supersymmetry within the set of symmetry? Um, I, no, I think supersymmetry fits perfectly well in what I've said here. Uh, though I, I won't talk about it at all further, but I think I think it fits perfectly fine in this. Thank you. Okay, 
So let's keep going. So, um, good. So the first big topic is the kind of a general theory of symmetry, or at least some generalizations of symmetry. So we'll talk about symmetry and topological operators. So this will be uh, a viewpoint on global symmetry that we will develop. And the main claim to fame of this viewpoint is that it will not require us to talk about conserved currents. Conserved currents are useful. We'll talk about them when we need to. Um, but we'll try to get away from them for reasons that will become clear soon. So let's start with an initial definition. So an initial definition that everybody should be familiar with is that Q, a conserved charge, could be written as the integral over space of the time component of a current. So this is some conserved charge. And it's conserved uh, in time precisely because the current is divergenceless. Well, of course, everybody knows uh, about that. Now, we're going to successively generalize this definition. So, as a first step, let's be in a d dimensional uh, Euclidean QFT. So uh, up here, um, in the initial definition that we had, we were um, we were talking about a kind of Lorentzian point of view where we distinguished space as being special and time was going perpendicular to that. Uh, it will be advantageous to us to think in a more Euclidean way where space and time are on an equal footing. So in this case, we can look at a charge which I will call Q of m d minus 1, we find to be the integral over m d minus 1 of star j. <coughs> so um, here, m d minus 1, this is now any d minus 1 submanifold. Let's take it to be closed. But it has no boundary for right now. Um, so, in, so space, which was itself, of course, a, a d minus one manifold, um, has now been replaced with this more general m d minus one, and we're trying to associate a charge to this manifold. And I've written here star j. Star j is what replaces j sub zero. So um, star here, this is the Hodge star. And an important little factoid uh, that you should memorize is that a current, the current J mu is divergenceless implies that the exterior derivative of the Hodge star is zero. So here we're, we're writing integral in differential form notation. So, you know, this star j, j with, uh, up here had one index, so it was a one form. And star of it is a d minus one form. And hence can naturally be integrated over a d minus one manifold, m. So this is our notion of a charge associated to a general uh, manifold. You could think of m d minus one as a, as a spatial slice if it makes uh, if it makes it more easy. And uh, of course, just as we can consider the charge, we can also consider the exponentiated uh, operators, which are the group elements. So these typically are called U alpha, also associated to m d minus 1, 
and we'll write this as the exponential of i alpha q m b minus 1. So alpha, you could think of, is now a group label. Meaning that q, uh, thinking a little more invariantly, uh, q was generating the Lie algebra of our symmetry group, and this u alpha is now generating the group. So alpha is some phase in this formula. Okay, wh why talk about the uh, why talk about the the u's and not the q's? Well, the u's are generally preferred. Why? Well, discrete symmetry has no charges. This is our first thing we're going to have to contend with. So, you know, if you have a system with a Z2 global symmetry, then there's no, there's no infinitesimal version of it. There's no Lie algebra version of it. There's no Q. But there is the U. There is the group, uh, th there is the group value operator. So we'll try to work with the U's. Okay. So now I'd like to summarize the key properties of the operators U alpha. Okay, property one. U alpha of M D minus one depends topologically on M D minus 1. Well, what does it mean to say that something uh, depends topologically on M D minus 1? It means that uh, whatever this manifold M D minus 1 is, we can wiggle it a little bit, and we'll get the same operator back. Now, you're familiar with that. You're familiar with that because, you know, if you go back to the usual space-time picture, so say here was space, or in our fancier version, m d minus 1, and this is at some... So here we can draw a time axis. And then maybe we make a small perturbation that is, we bump up space a little bit in time. This is later. Or uh, in our fancier version, we'll think this as a perturbation m tilde d minus 1, where we've done some small motion of m d minus 1. And we'd like to say that the charge uh, on m and, uh, or more generally, the group element on m and m tilde are equal. Let's try to compute the difference. So how do we compute the difference? The integral over m d minus 1 of star j. And let's subtract from it the integral of star j over m tilde d minus 1. So I've taken, uh, so I would like to show that this is 0 to show that u alpha depends topologically on md minus 1. Now, I'm going to use a Stokes theorem. So, there is, in this diagram, a kind of d manifold here. which is this slab. So the slab we'll call X. So the slab has the feature that uh, M D minus 1 and tilde D minus 1 are its boundary. So therefore, uh, according to Stokes' theorem, I can write this equation. And then finally, I can remember that the conservation equation, 
that is uh, d mu j mu equals zero means that star j is closed. So this is actually zero. So this is the, the proof that the u's are, uh, depend topologically on m d minus one. And this is the beginning of a very deep uh, uh, rabbit hole, or uh, hopefully not wild goose chase, but rabbit hole, um, linking uh, top topology and symmetry. So what we're noticing here is that uh, if you have a symmetry, then your quantum field theory has a topological operator. That is an operator that can be moved without altering correlation functions. Okay, so that was property one. Property two. Property two is that u alpha m d minus one implements symmetry transformations on operators. How can we understand that? So what does it even mean? To, so let's imagine here is a local operator. We'll call it O. And this point where it's inserted uh, zero. And let's say uh, this is some charged local operator. Let's surround this local operator with u alpha. So no dimensions make sense. So uh, u alpha, let's put it on an s d minus 1. So we're in d space total dimensions. You can visualize uh, you know, d equals 3 if it's easy for our uh, little human brains. Then uh, we have a local operator at the origin, and we have a sphere of codimension 1 in our visualization that would be a two-sphere surrounding the local operator. And on that sphere, we put this topological operator, u alpha. Okay, so what do we know about this configuration? So what I would like to tell you is that this is equal to to the I alpha Q sub O, where this is the charge of O, times O at zero, with now no U alpha anymore. U alpha has now been gone. So, so I can replace, in other words, this U on a sphere surrounding O with this phase. What is being asserted here? So, first of all, I claim this is true from the Ward identity. And I will explain that in a minute. But what is being asserted here, notice in our, in our discussion up here, we said that U was topological. So we can make a little wiggle of the sphere. For instance, we could change the radius of the sphere a small amount, and nothing would happen. What is being asserted here is what happens when you try to pull the U through another operator, in this case, O. So an important subtlety here, when we're talking about uh, saying that U alpha depends topologically on MD minus 1, or on this argument, we're allowed to make motions of the operators as much as we like, as long as they don't cross other operators. Those don't count as small deformations anymore. So here we're learning what is the cost of crossing a local operator. And why does this follow from the Ward identity? Well, the Ward identity says that d star j, when you have a charged operator, is no longer zero. Rather, it is some number of attempts to get right times the charge of O times a delta function at the location of the operator. 
So now you can, you can go up here to this Stokes problem and imagine trying to, uh, so MD minus one we could take to be this sphere that surrounds the operator. And M tilde we could make, take to be say a tiny sphere that doesn't surround the operator somewhere else. And what we would learn is that the cost of changing between the two is this, uh, is this phase. Okay, so these are, uh, these are the two key properties that I wanted to highlight. And I would like to say that uh, in a general quantum field theory, so in general, in QFT, we're going to define the notion of global symmetry by the existence of topological operators. Now, uh, so that, let's call them U of M D minus one. Now, of course, there's one other property of a global symmetry that I should emphasize to you, which is that typically we like the global symmetry to form a group. And I didn't say, how can you figure out what group it is from these u's? Well, the group law comes from the fusion algebra. So we could take u g1 on m d minus 1, and we could just stack it on top of u g2 of m d minus 1. And this will be equal to the third u, u g1 g2 of m d minus 1. So this here is the product in the, in the group. So it's the operator product expansion, so the operator product of these u's that is encoding for us which group it is that we are talking about. I have a question. Sure. Uh, so, like, here the 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 G G two product depends on the order of application of the operator, or does it depend on which set is picked? I guess the second operator could also have any different anything there, right? Does it also depend on which set uh, which surface contains which subset uh, surface? So, uh, so I think you asked two questions. One question you might have asked is. Does the um, uh, can this product be non-abelian? That is, it, does it depend on the order g1, g2? And absolutely, it can depend on the order g1, g2. Uh, that is, u g1, u g2 need not be equal to u g2, u g1. And you can think of that geometrically. Remember, these are topological operators, so imagine separating them a little bit and trying to smoosh them on top of each other. And there's no way to continuously interpolate between this configuration and this configuration. So um, there can be a non-abelian there. I think your second question was whether the product could depend on this internal argument m d minus 1. And the answer to that is no. So you should think that the, the product doesn't really know what, um, uh, uh, with what the global topology of this m d minus 1 is. It's something that happens locally. You can imagine just squishing two pieces of the u's on top of each other. Uh, I, I was wondering, like, if I put on some radial kind of conversation, then in the natural sense in which the order is determined by which surface contains which one, right? I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. Um, uh, so I was thinking of some kind of like radial conversation or something, and in that in that sense, if I apply two operators inside a correlator, it kind of it kind of uh, arranges the order for me in the sense of which surface is inside the other one. Um, yes, it sounds like you're saying that it, what, it sounds like you're saying you have an example of this. Great. Um, okay. Um, more questions? I have a question, actually. So, 
to define the Hodge operator, the Hodge star, you need a metric. So I'm just wondering, um, suppose the spatial slice is spin, right? But then the other spatial slice has the opposite spin structure. Could we still argue that the, uh, because then X of D is non-bounding anymore, right? That's a spin structure that's non-bounding. So could we still argue that the operator would um, still be topological? I mean, there's some anomalies showing up, right? Well, without addressing the details of the particular configuration you have in mind, let me just say that what I, what the word topological really means is that whenever you have an XD, an MD, and an M tilde, an M and an M tilde that satisfy this equation, that is, there exists an XD for which these two are the common boundary, then you can move M to M tilde. Okay, but if there's like additional so tangent, if, if, yeah. if, if, if the uh, if for some subtle reason the you know the maybe you're talking about a tricky part, point of uh, um, analysis involving fermions and maybe for mm -hmm. some reason your U's depend on spin structure that can happen then you would want this equation to be true as spin manifolds. Right. Yeah, but that's what I mean by saying that it's topological. I mean that okay. there, this, that, that there exists an XD decorated by whatever fanciness you need in order. Um, uh, so that this M and M tilde can be uh, moved to each other. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Um, more questions? Yeah, there's a question in the, in the chat by Gule Silva. I don't know if he wants to open the microphone. Well, uh, okay. Uh, he asks, uh, could the action of U on operator O mix O with other ops Um, so, in general, absolutely. I did a very simple uh, application where U was uh, um, was an abelian, uh, generating some abelian subgroup. In which case, all the irreducible representations are um, are one dimensional, labeled by some charge. Um, but you could have you, you could talk about these U's for a non-abelian symmetry, in which case the representations would be, um, in general, more than one dimensional. And that will be reflected in the word identity. Yes, yes thank you. So okay. I had a question, in the group law, yes. do both the operators uh, the U G one U G two required to are required to be defined on the same submanifold M D minus one, or they can be defined on different submanifolds. Like in your example, let's say different two spheres. So, uh, you know, as long as the manifolds differ by a topological deformation, it doesn't matter. Um, so, for instance, you could have one sphere inside another sphere, strictly inside. I see. So th there, there must not be any charges in between, let's say, the two. Uh, or in, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's keep going. Okay. Well, maybe I should give uh, one simple example. The example will be the Ising model. Just as a cartoon example. So in the Ising model, there are spins. So, uh, maybe we could look at a state where over here everything is down. And we can introduce a co-dimension one topological operator. Mm. So the Ising model has a Z2 symmetry. Which flips the spins. So case time is being cut in two.
apply this uh, Z2 symmetry defect. Ah, so uh, terminological point, um, these U's up here are often called defects. So uh, notice that um, since this since flipping the spins is a symmetry, you can only uh, this insertion. at the defect. So that's the statement that it's codimensional. It's like I flipped the spins all the way to the right going off to infinity here, but because uh, the energy cost of being up and being down is the same, I really only detect something right at the interface where, um, where there's some misalignment. And the second point I'd like about this operator is that in general, It is not the integral of something local. So there's this Z2 symmetry. There's a U. You can call it U sub minus 1 in the notation that I was talking about. It can be placed on any codimension 1 manifold in the Ising model. But there's no current. There's no charge. So this is the uh, first kind of situation where you see that forcing yourself to speak in terms of the language of the symmetry defect is buying you something. It's, it's enabling you to say, what does it mean to say that there's a Z2 global symmetry in my quantum field theory? Is, is a domain wall a good way to, is this the same thing as a domain wall, for yes. example? Yes. yes, 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 yes. So a domain wall can realize um, uh, do domain walls often are, are the realization of the symmetry defects in the special case um, when uh, the symmetry is spontaneously broken. So I talked to, uh, that comment, you know, maybe needs some more, on, uh, some more thought, but, uh, but yes, so, so the answer is that depending on the phase of, of your theory, you may find, um, you may realize the use in different ways, maybe as domain walls. Okay. Good. So, all right. So we've rephrased. Uh, we, we've built this basic link between um, symmetry and topological operators. And what I'd like to spend the the last uh, some number of minutes talking about is higher form global symmetry. Okay, so now that we've set the, the language, it should be easy. So the definition is that a Q form is characterized by the instance of topological operators of codimension Q plus one. So there'll be some UG or U alpha, but now instead of being on M D minus one, it'll be on M D minus one minus Q. So the geometry of this situation is such that charged operators 
So a uh, little remark here. The case Q equals 0 was the so-called ordinary symmetry that we talked about above, the symmetry that everybody should be familiar with, where uh, the symmetry operator lived on a spatial slice, so it was co-dimension 1. Okay, so returning to this situation with general Q, that a charged operator uh, for a Q-form symmetry has dimension Q. So that's what the terminology is supposed to help you remember. What is the dimension of the thing that is charged? So for an ordinary symmetry, zero. So the dimension of the thing that is charged is zero, meaning it's a point operator, a local operator that lives at a point. So what's the picture? The picture is that we have some something like this. So here's L, an extended operator of dimension Q. Here is our Q on S uh, D minus 1 minus Q. Now it's linking this extended operator. And we can remove this, this U, at the cost of a phase. Okay, some of you may be asking, what's going on in the Hilbert space picture? So in Hilbert space, let's say space, uh, we'll call space Y D minus, that's our spatial slice. So you can ask, what's going, what implications does a Q-form symmetry have for the Hilbert space of my theory uh, on y d minus 1? So the answer is simple. A Q-form symmetry gives conserved charges. It gives one conserved charge. for each non-trivial d minus minus q cycle in space. Okay, wrap your head around this by, uh, by doing the gut check when q equals zero. So when Q equals zero, you're talking about an ordinary global symmetry. And you know there should be a unique conserved charge acting on the Hilbert space. How do you see it? Or, conser or a group element act, uh, acting on the Hilbert space. How do you see it? You see it by saying that, well, I'm looking for a D minus one cycle in Y D minus one. Well, that's just all of Y D minus one, right? The charge wraps all of space. Okay, enough with the, um, with the sort of abstract formalism. It's now time to zoom in and talk about gauge fields. Let's see, how much time? I have five minutes. Hmm. Okay. We'll start this, and we'll keep going with it next. There is a question that we can keep. Please, yes, through. go. No, okay. it's fine. All right. Hi, uh, what's the highest value of Q again? The highest value of Q. Um, like in three dimensions, is it uh, two, right? Yes, though, uh, D minus one form symmetry uh, in these space-time dimensions is a bit odd. 
most non-trivial applications stop at D minus 2. I see. So, wait, but in two dimensions, there aren't these two form symmetries that take you from one species of line operator to another? Yes, but there's, yes. So, there's a lot of fine print around that case. Let me put it that way. I think the, so one can fit it into this box, but I think sort of the most uniform treatment happens, provided you don't allow yourself to approach the dimension of space-time too closely. And also, that's where sort of the most interesting applications happen. Okay, thanks. Okay. One form symmetry in gauge theory. We'll start. Simplest case, continuous one form symmetry. What is continuous one form symmetry? This is the same thing as having a conserved current with two indices. So, we have a current, J mu nu, anti-symmetric, and its divergence is zero. And of course, this is the same thing as saying that D of star J, this thing is now a D minus two form. So I'll put a subscript D minus two to remind you that this is closed. Okay, what's your go-to example of this? The go-to example is 4D free Maxwell theory. This has two. By free Maxwell theory, I just mean free U1 gauge theory. We'll soon add some matter and see what happens. But let's just start with free Maxwell theory. Okay, so these two one-form symmetries are commonly called U1. So we put a superscript one to remind ourselves that it's a one-form symmetry. And there's one that's called the electric, so I'll put sub-electric. And there's one that's called U1 magnetic. Okay, what are the currents? So the first is that we have the field strength. So F mu nu is an obvious candidate for a current. It's a two-form operator in our theory. And indeed, it is conserved by the Maxwell equation of motion. So that's giving us our first one-form symmetry, which is called the electric one. Now there is also star F. D mu of star F mu nu. And this is also zero by the Bianchi identity. Okay, so in the last, I need 30 seconds to finish this thought. So what are the charged objects? The charged objects are line operators. Let's call such a line operator L. Let's extend it a long time at the origin of space. Notice that I knew it was a line operator because I'm talking about a one-form symmetry. So the charged object is dimension one. Okay, and then we can see that the kind of Ward identities, the integrated form of the Ward identities, is that the integral of star F over S2 is the electric charge of L. So 
So, for instance, this could be the Wilson line charge. So here I'm imagining that in space, and here's L, remember L extends along time, so it's point in space. And then I have this two sphere here surrounding it. That's what's happening in this picture. So that's one identity. And then finally, the other one is that the interval of F over this S2 is the magnetic charge of L. So you could think of this as the Tocque line charge. So here we see our first uh, basic example, which is that Maxwell theory has two U1 one-form symmetries. And we see that the, uh, the charge object are lines. And this is the beginning of a uh, kind of important uh, theme, which is that one-form symmetry and higher form symmetry in, in general, but in particular one-form symmetry, is really uh, very useful for diagnosing behavior of gauge theories and for understanding properties of gauge theories. So we will continue to develop that uh, over the course of the next lecture. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Clay, for this very interesting lecture. And uh, before we turn to questions, let's thank Clay, uh, either by opening the microphones or by using the feature of Zoom. And uh, there was a question from Wayne Zhao, uh, which I postponed until the end. So Wayne, if you're still here, please ask your question. Okay, probably Wayne disconnected. Oh. No, 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 he said his oh. question was answered. Okay, yeah, he said his question was answered. Uh, so the next question is from Elba. Uh, Elba, if you can... Uh, ask your question, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, sure, thank you. Uh, my question is, uh, isn't you want here gauge symmetry? I thought we were only going to talk about global symmetries. Am I missing something? Uh, you mean this you one here? Yeah. Yeah, that, that is, indeed, we were talking about you one gauge uh, theory, but I'm not talking about this you one at any moment, right? This you, this, the, yeah, there are lots of U ones. It's important to get them straight. So this is a gauge, uh, uh, a gauge redundancy. Um, you know, it's best for us to break this uh, historical anachronism and uh, historical problem and stop calling it gauge symmetry. We'll just call it gauge redundancy or something. We even break the the temptation to have a link. So um, mm -hmm. here, uh, it, these U ones are true global symmetries of the system. They're generated by these currents, F and star F. So those are not gauge, those are global symmetries of the system. Thank you. So the next question from Hank. Yep, I, I just wanted to um, maybe make a comment that the, um, the uh, code dimension two defects can actually end on code dimension one defects, right? Well, the question of what things can end and what things cannot end is sort of intimately tied up to what is actually a good global symmetry and what is not a global symmetry. So let's go back to this um, problem here, th this picture here. So uh, suppose this line, let, let's imagine this is a line because it looked like a line. Suppose that line could end. Then I claim that uh, it can't be charged. Why? Well, if it can end, I can just cut it open with the ends and move it around U. After all, U is topological, so that should cost me nothing. Mm -hmm. And then this formula would not be correct. So actually, the question of what can end and what cannot end is, uh, is sort of crucially related to what the actual symmetries of mm -hmm. are. So I guess, yeah, I guess you're only thinking about G, like, 
uh, uh, you fix Q basically, and then think about G as had uh, as endowing sort of this Q form global symmetry structure on, on your theory. You're not thinking about like mixing different Qs. I guess it's well, there is. I mean, this is the first in a sequence of generalizations. So the first the first generalization of the concept of symmetry that we're discussing right now is the introduction of the integer Q. So then we can mm -hmm. have a zero form symmetry, which we're familiar with from our first QFT class. We can also have one form symmetry, two form symmetry, et cetera, which is what I'm telling you about now. And in the first pass, these all live in different universes. They don't talk to each other very much. So you just have a kind of different symmetry algebra at each Q. And, um, and you know, that could be empty in some Qs. Um, and then the, the, the next pass is to realize um, that sometimes these different concepts of symmetry for different Q can mix. Sometimes there can be interesting fusion algebras involving different Qs. Mm -hmm. That is sometimes called, uh, the simplest version of that is sometimes called the higher group symmetry. Mm -hmm. um, so that's sort of the next layer in this onion of generalization of, of symmetry. And then there are yet more. Um, but, but yeah, so I don't, I don't uh, it's not that I can't contemplate the idea that they would mix. It's more like I'm deliberately giving you the first pass. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There are two more questions. And, uh, well, if, if there's any more questions, let's keep them for uh, discussion, uh, which will, ha which will uh, uh, take place in a little bit less than an hour from now. So there was a question from Kushar. If it's a short question, please ask it now. It's just a clarification. So, in the example, like if you scroll down, then the de for the one form symmetry, we have del mu j mu nu. In this j mu nu, the indices slightly above. In the j mu nu, which you have written, the square bracket tells us that these are symmetrized indices or A anti symmetrized. I, I this was my way of I was running out of time, so. This is my way of trying to uh, visually enforce the idea that J is anti-symmetric. So J is a two-form. It's a current with two indices. Oh, right. but those indices right. are anti-symmetric. Right, okay, yeah, it's a two-form. And in the, finally, in this, uh, you had the object run along the time direction at the origin. But yeah. let's say if this infinite line operator was oriented in some other way, then how could we have surrounded it with the S2? Well, oh. that's the advantage of, of uh, living in the Euclidean world, is that uh, there isn't actually any preferred... Uh, oh, okay. so, so the fact that the, that the S2 can surround it is just a statement about uh, a line and the two-sphere yes. being linked in four, oh. in four dimensions. Okay. So I, oh. I help you get to that point by saying, think of it extending along time, but if it were extended along space, the same geometric thing is true. Yes, okay, thank you. So, and the last question was uh, asked by Lucas, who asked, uh, his microphone is not working, so he asked, what happens if two line defects meet at one point? What happens if two line defects meet at a point? Well, I mean, in general, in QFT, you would expect that there's some kind of fusion algebra. That, um, you know, there, there's some set of lo a kind of uh, local operators that are stuck to these lines, and there's some kind of OPE uh, there. I think certain examples of that have been worked out, but it's not very well explored. All right, so uh, I'm sorry to postpone the remaining questions, uh, but we need I'll be some back time to, uh, for, for, for a break, and then uh, we'll... Dimitri, can, can you remind me what time I'm supposed to be back? So it's in 50 minutes from now. Five zero minutes. Okay, I will be back. All right, great. Thank you. Thank you, Clay.